Welcome to Business Amplified with host Kevin A. Dunlap. This podcast is for small business owners aiming to amplify their enterprises. Explore strategies to play a bigger game by becoming an author, public speaker, podcast host, or expanding your brand in other ways. Elevate your business on Business Amplified. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Business Amplified. I'm your host, Kevin Dunlap, and today we have a gentleman by the name of David Frankel, and I'm very interested in finding out more about what he does and who he is. So, uh, David, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Well, it's my pleasure. So, uh, David, uh, tell us a little, a little bit about who you are, what is it that you do, and why is it that you do it? Well, that's a very complex question, but let me see if I can knock it out without uh, putting your audience to sleep. So I have, uh, I'm have i an entrepreneur, business owner, inventor. Uh, I have uh, six children, three are still at home, and three are uh, either grown or married or uh, off to college. So we're down to just three at the house now. So juggling entrepreneurship and family is always a challenge, and obviously their activities and so on and so forth. Uh, for a full-time job, I have a retail space at South Park Mall, which is a, a mall here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we offer uh, innovation products. Uh, my invention called the Perky Collar, which lifts the collar up so it doesn't lay flat, along with other innovative products like pockets for holders, holeless belts. Uh, we have lapel projects so you can transform your lapel on a, a jacket to make it look like a tuxedo. We have magnet tucks that keep your shirt tucked in. Uh, just lots of cool innovative products to solve problems. We have work in stiffs, which actually is a collar stay that keeps the collar straight, but also because it's naturally magnetic, it has a magnet you can put on the inside of the collar to bring the collar in. So lots of cool little innovative products. Uh, then we also have a lot of fashion accessories from bow ties to pocket squares to bracelets to fedoras, like so, becoming more and more popular all across the company country, uh, as well as uh, you know just helping people with different fashion needs, whether it be a wedding coming up or a prom or a homecoming or whatever their uh, gala they're going to, sneaker balls. There's lots of occasions where people come visit me. And uh, we also have an online presence. It's perkyllc.com. Uh, we're also in 366 stores across the country where they carry some of our innovative products. So that's been a process for the last, uh, we, we started in 2015. So for the last nine years, uh, we worked really hard on getting a lot of our products into stores. And then just to show the stores how easy it was, I went ahead and opened up my own retail store uh, five years ago. So I think that's a good start. <laughs> well, congratulations, congratulations on that. And yes, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I, I would assume a, a lot of the stuff that you do for, let's say for men or even women, it helps them with their branding identity. Because I, I do know a gentleman uh, back where I used to live, back in Las Vegas, he wears a Pandora and that's part of who he is. That's part of uh, his image. So having, like I said, having the the uh, nicely tucked uh, or uh, displayed collars or the, like, I know some people that do wear bow ties. And when people that are in their 30s and 40s that wear bow ties, then that's part of who their image is. is so why is it that you went into this kind of industry? I mean, and congratulations on being in over 360 stores. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And another big milestone we've reached recently is we had 27,000 of the Perky Collars sold, which has been a big milestone from dropping 5,000 on my doorstep to now uh, reordering several times and now uh, on the verge of ordering a, a sixth time, uh, which is exciting. So uh, I guess the answer to your question is, why did I get into this? Uh, it just kind of happened. I, I was getting ready for a working for another company. This is 10, 12 years ago. And I was wearing a lot of dress shirts and blazers. And uh, I was getting ready to go talk to a business owner that uh, had a car mechanic shop, a car sh a repair shop. And I knew I couldn't really wear a tie to that event. It'd just be too dressy. So I always like to wear a dress or a blazer, maybe some jeans. And I took a shirt out of, out of the uh, my closet and the collar looked really droopy and saggy. And I'm like, but well, this is weird. I do heavy starts. It shouldn't be happening. So I got another shirt, same thing. And I started realizing that uh, there's a structural integrity issues with my shirts and it's not because they're bad shirts. It's just, you wash them, you wear them, you store them. They all kind of collapse at some point. So I, at that point said, I can't go to a, a meeting looking like this. I got to find a solution. So I ran to my daughter's bedroom, looked at my bathroom, looked at my other kids' bedrooms, looking for something I could stick in my collar just to make it look good enough for the meeting. And I stumbled on a headband that I put in my collar uh, for the meeting, ran to the hall bath and looked and looked, hey, you know what? This doesn't look so bad. It looks definitely better than my shirt looked before. 
And uh, I was at the time, the company I was working for, or a company I knew of, I should say, was doing inventions in like a garage warehouse space. So after the meeting was over, I called them and said, hey, it's a company called here in Charlotte called Inventus. I called them and said, hey, I have an idea to stop the droopy, saggy Drescher collar. And this is 2014. And they said, that's very intriguing. That's I was like, well, don't you know, make sure you stop me at any point if you feel like there's no need for this product. And like, no, no, we see people wearing less and less ties moving forward. No one's a fortune teller, but we saw people becoming less, less dressy and more casual. And this is before COVID even happened, which obviously that was the full flip switch. Everybody's casual now. Uh, and I just figured, why not solve a problem if I can? Uh, and then, you know, fast forward, I started uh, the process of the prototyping and manufacturing. And then I had 5,000 laying in my lap. And that process of having 5,000 units, which by the way, 3% of all inventors that have patents ever develop their product, 3%. So it's sad to know how many great ideas are in their grave right now that could have been revolutionary because it didn't take the time to bring it to market. So I'm proud to say, even though it's been challenging and it's been hard, I'm glad I finally put my money where my mouth is. I did solve the problem of droopy, saggy collars. And then once I did that, okay, oh, now I need to let people know I have this product. So now a whole business was launched with, okay, now I need to let people know what this perky collar is. How does it work? Be ready for the naysayers. Be ready for the poo-poo people. Be ready for the people that love it. You'll be ready for all the different, like it's plastic. What's this? What's that? I don't like your box. I don't like the product. I don't like, be ready for all of that. You have to have tough skin. Uh, and at some point you say, okay, I appreciate your opinion. Thank you for your feedback and just take the high road. And you start doing trade shows. I went to Vegas, New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Minneapolis. And I was just trying to intercept uh, retail store owners as they walk by. No one's there to see me. And that's the big message you have to take away. If you're an inventor or thinking about inventing a product and think it's going to be easy to get in store shelves, it's not. Your product has to replace someone else's product. So it's, they have no idea there's no history with you. They have no idea if it's going to sell through or not. They have no idea if it's the right price point. They don't know if, if what you have is going to solve a problem, if anybody's going to care. And they're yeah. going to take a risk on you potentially and buy a dozen, two dozen, three dozen, whatever it may be. Mm. You're talking big box. Now you're talking a lot more units, a lot more space, uh, a lot more money that they didn't you know, delegate for you last year. So there's just a lot of things you have to keep space you know, in a store. You know, the shelf space is very challenging. All these things I really didn't think about, you know, moving forward. But then when I was in the middle of it, I realized that my salesmanship had to fine tune in order for me to convince them or encourage them, I should say, not really convince, but encourage them to try this new product. And, to get, you know, they know their customers. They know what their customers complain about. Give my product a chance. So going to all the trade shows, stopping people, again, not being afraid of rejection. Uh, it just kind of forced me into the invention world. And then from there, you know, I... I Try to figure out all the different ways I could touch people that cared about fashion. And I think that's one of the biggest keys is how big is your market? If your market's not big, I wouldn't even bother. But if you have a decent sized market, and that's why I want to push this to tech because everyone has a cell phone. It's a huge market. Same thing developed that's tech related, uh, whether it be a computer mainframe or whether it be people's cell phone, there's a huge opportunity globally. When you're inventing a product, we don't know if it's going to be adopted regionally, locally, nationally, internationally. So it, there's a risk reward there. Uh, but I think you, you get out there and you start doing it. And then you start, you know, instead of just selling your product, I think one of the things I did that was smart is I walked around the trade show to meet other inventors of other products that we could cross, uh, cross promote each other. So maybe I can carry their product on my website. They can carry mine on their website. Uh, I could carry it in a retail store in the future. Uh, so that's was what really helped us build a clothing innovation company and not just a perky collar company is that once someone had a perky collar, they don't need another one because it lasts several years. So I started realizing that it's important for me not just to sell while I'm at these trade shows, but to network, to meet store owners. These store owners that bought, no other store owners that may want to buy in other cities. So it's all about networking. Your ability to network is the biggest uh, secret sauce to being successful as an inventor, as a business owner, in my opinion. Because people know people. And if you mess one up or you do treat one wrong, they're going to tell other people. Bad news travels a lot faster. So make sure you have good integrity. Make sure you do things properly. Make sure you do things ethically, morally. If something breaks or something doesn't arrive, fix it. It's going to cost you a lot more not to fix it. And if a customer is upset, a customer wants to do a return, give them their money back. Give them a, a, a exchange for something else. It's a very small percentage people are going to return and, and want money back anyway. But to not give money back, to let them go on social media, on Google, and write bad reviews is going to cause a lot more damage 
than the money you could have given back to them to begin with. But just stand behind your products. Make sure you're finding good quality products. And from there, I just made sure that it solved problems. And I just continued to call stores. I can go to trade shows. Uh, at the at the mall now, I'm always stopping people with different things I have. We have wooden bow ties that are also very cool. So if someone has a shirt on that says Detroit or Chicago, I'll say, hey, you're from Detroit? Yeah, I am. Okay, come, let me show you something. This is a Detroit wooden bow tie made in the skyline of Detroit that's not available in Detroit. Oh, that's so cool. So a lot of it has to do with making sure your presentation is attractive. Instead of being obnoxious and salesy, just have an incredible presentation. Well, yeah, th uh, there's a um, a book out there uh, that's called Delivering Happiness. Have you have you heard or read that book? I have not. It is uh, written by a gentleman by the name of uh, Tony Shea. He's the one that invented Zappos, and okay. he was all about customer service. I mean, he was way just like what you're just saying, way about customer service, offering them a a a uh, an equal exchange rate or a money back guarantee. Uh, because like you said, very, very, very few people are going to be uh, are they going to be asking for that thing? And by you delivering that kind of service just makes you stand out even more uh, or even better because you ensure that you have a lot more integrity. So I, I applaud that you uh, have done some, uh, something like that. So congr congratulations on that. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about, about your journey from the beginning, from concept to uh, getting that first or that, that first 5,000 uh, units uh, ordered. Yeah, I think it just comes down to uh, surrounding yourself with a great team. Uh, nobody knows everything about everything. So uh, one of the first things I did that was smart is I hired a company here in Charlotte that's invented lots and lots of products. So they can walk me through the product, the process, because I think a lot of people make mistakes and try to do it themselves or try to cut corners and try and save a buck and it ends up costing the long run. So they helped me with the packaging. They helped me with the sourcing. They helped me with the product development. And it all costs money. I mean, it's not cheap. I mean, I probably spent over $100,000 just in the product development of a simple piece of plastic. Uh, it does, it's a functional piece of plastic. It's a very cool piece of plastic, but it's, and it's a polycarbonate. Uh, but I, I just didn't have the resources to find what material I could use to make this product out of. So I have, you know, surrounding yourself with people that can help you through the process is important. And then sourcing. You know, I tried to find a manufacturer in the United States, and everyone said, "Well, how many units are you going to make?" And I said, "Well, five. They're like, "Oh, well, sir, you, until you're in the big boy league of twenty-five thousand units, a hundred thousand units, we're not going to help you." I'm like, yeah, but I want a made in USA product. I'm like, I'm sorry, sir, you, you got to dig deeper in your pockets. And make more like well this is i'm i'm not even sure this is a proof of concept yet i don't want to invest enough money to buy twenty five thousand units until i know five thousand units will sell ideally one thousand units but five was the minimum i could find anywhere in the globe so that was part of the challenge as well is finding someone to help me make this product and make it a reality and not just make it in my kitchen or my garage and so on so, and some things you can and if you can more power to you but it's hard to scale if you're making everything yourself because you can't make everything yourself and try and turn around and sell it Something's going to give. Uh, so it was nice that I had them made. Um, the perky collar was made in one plant. The box was made in another. So we had the whole design phase. They had sent us prototypes of the box. It didn't fit uh, the first time. Um, so we had to send it back and make tweaks. And eventually it came back. It was a perfect fit. I wanted to be snug so it wasn't moving around the box. Uh, the box I use is, is really attractive. Uh, I can give you a, a quick example of it. Uh, but it's really nice because it has a, a magnetic lid. Uh, it just has a really nice retail ready presentation. And I think that's also very important. And again, that's about having the team around you that knows what they're doing and it's good quality. You open the box five times and it breaks. That's a reflection of you. So I probably spent a little more in the box than I should have. But at the same time, if someone's going to have this product for two, three years, it's important the box holds up. So to fast forward, I have a product, I have a box, I have 5,000 of them uh, yeah, in my house. Uh, initially, I, I got to have Perky Palace first, the box came later. So I had 5,000 of just the perky collar and I had to have the boxes made locally. And that was torture because I had to put it all together. So I had to have box parties in my house where people came and we assembled the plastic cover. We had the box. We had to put the sticker inside the box. And then once we put the cover on top, we had a little paper wrap around with a little tiny adhesive. It was really small. They had a little peel away. We had a peel away adhesive. And we wrapped around the box. That was one box. you know. And if you had an order of 25 or 50 or 100, you're spending several hours putting together boxes. And uh, that was a learning curve as well. And I just kept counting on the days. When do my already made boxes arrive in Charlotte? Because that's going to be a, a great day. And uh, and most importantly, I the company that does the perky collars then drives the perky collars to the box plant, which is a couple hours away. 
And that way I don't have to put the perky calories in the box as well. And that saves a lot of time and effort when I'm shipping out orders. Like this morning, I sent out 72. It's nice. They sent me the label. I put the label on it and ship it out, drop it off at the UPS store. But if I was still putting the product in the box, that would be a much longer process. And it just slows things down. So now everything's packaged in 72 and they all arrive ready to ship out. I, I will admit that you're probably the second uh, uh, inventor that I've met that invented a a a, a functional tactile uh, a product. I have a friend of mine. Her name is Diane, and she I made something called uh, the Swifter. I think that's what, what she called it. And it's what, what you put um, uh, eggnog, not eggnog. What is that? A uh, paprika into a, uh, into this device, and it uh, and, and you put it over devil's eggs, and it gives the the, the perfect sprinkle over devil's eggs. And right. I, I, I remember when she was still in the invention phase. And she was looking for a a, a person to a, a manufacturer, and she ended up going over to China. And then she went on to uh, the, one of those uh, uh, I seen on TV uh, shows, and and you know, and, she, and she was telling me that process. I mean, and and you're going through, and you went through the exact same thing because that uh, for her, I, I don't know if she did it all herself or if she had help. But the fact is that you realize early on that hey, I need help on this. I need to find somebody else that does inventions of a physical, uh, a tactile uh, uh, object, and how can I go about doing that? Because most people, I think, out there have no idea. You know what you went through? Like they, it's never even part of it, even crossed their mind. Like, what kind of a box is this going to go in? And that became something that was very, very important to you, as well as the design and the labeling and all the other stuff that you had to go through as well. And that's actually a very good point because I didn't even know it was going to go in a box initially. I was thinking of a hang tag or something simple to hang at a store. Uh, and then I was an audition for Shark Tank in 2017. And that whole process, I was able to be part of a Facebook group of uh, Shark Tank uh, people that you know, tried out. And one of the people on the group said, if you want this product to sell well in stores, it needs to go in a box. He's like, and if you think about it, things always sell more in a box, whether it be underwear, whether it be t-shirts, whether it be no matter what, uh, toys, everything sells better in a box. And I thought, okay, well, now we got to find a box that this thing can go into. But initially, you know, I didn't know either. I mean, all this is trial and error. And uh, I think sometimes inventors try and over perfect things before they launch it. But at the same time, there's some things you just got to do right from the very beginning. Uh, but, you know, you can always make adjustments. Like some people say, hey, does this come in a bigger size? Well, I could come out with a perky collar XL for those that have a neck size that are 20 to 24, like offensive alignment in the NFL. But how big is that market? You know, so I went after the biggest market initially, which is 15 and 19 inch necks, which is the majority of people. So there's always ways for you to make another rendition. So don't over perfect it the first time. Make it good enough so it, it doesn't get bad feedback and bad reviews. But there's always ways to improve it in the future. So get something out there, learn from it, uh, listen to feedback. Don't be, don't take it personally. Don't uh, fire back at people when they tell you they don't like a product. Just listen to them. You don't have to listen to, don't take it personally necessarily. But I think that feedback is really important. Like initially, the perky collar was great because I like the razor look of it. But then people said, hey, sometimes it shows a little bit. If I turn a little bit and you see it just out of the corner, I don't like that. It's embarrassing to me. So that's when we decided to make it clear. So now the perky collar looks simply like this. So it's nice and clear. Okay. It's got tapered ends. If you can see that, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. And it's simply, all you do is lift the collar up. And you can see my collar without it. You know, looks like that. That's terrible. And everyone watching this can relate to this. And their shirts droop and sag and lay flat. So all you do is put this on. You'll have to professionally install it. Long tapered ends on top. And just drop it down. And you know you got the right product because it says perky collar on the device itself. There's unfortunately some copycatters out there, uh, not a lot, but there are a few, but they know them have perky collar on the, on the perky collar itself. So it's good to know that you're getting an authentic one that I developed if it says perky collar on the spine of the, of the device. Well, the thing is, it's kind of uh, odd because for, uh, for those that are just li uh, listening to, uh, to this show, um, uh, David, uh, he's wearing the perky collar right now. He took it off, and it was uh, obvious that his his collar was just like your average every everyday person. But now, when he put it back in, just that little that, that little nuance makes him look a lot more professional and a lot more uh, 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 appealing. In the, uh, uh, let's just say, in a business perspective. So, I mean. Uh, the fact that uh, David went out there, he uh, figured out a, a, a demand that people didn't even know that they needed, and then he went there and solved the problem. And now he's now in. Uh, he's in, are, are you national or international right now? 
Uh, we have stores international. So, I don't have any stores. So now here it is, ten years First later, one. and he's a, he's he's in a inter, he's got an international business. Congratulations on that, David. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a journey, and again, the, getting the international business is going to the trade shows and being not being afraid to fail and not being shy and getting used to rejection and just know that your next no is you're one step close to the next yes, uh, and just understand that you just, it's just part of the process. You got to keep going. You got to keep talking to people. Uh, you got to keep supporting them. You got you know support them through social media. You got to support them through your website. You got to make sure people know where to find them. Uh, and do a lot of things to help support that business, help that sell through. I've even gone to stores to help sell their own inventory just to help them. So the more you help the stores sell through, the more they're going to reorder. And that sell through is the key. If you can't sell through, you're not going to get a reorder. And, that's, and that is very important because a, a lot of stores will carry your product. Let's say at Kmart or Walmart or even a, a men's fashion uh, store, they will sell these as accessories. And but the thing is, like like you said, you've you've got to have that sell through so that they will go back and reorder uh, that uh, that 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 item because you know they're making a profit off of it. You're making a profit off of it, and and then that's just that's just how you grow your a a, a business that deals with an an actual product. Uh, so, uh, so David, I, I know you you have already sh I shared some of the uh, challenges that you went through. What, what, what do you think was one of your biggest challenges, and and what did you learn from that? You know, biggest challenge. I mean, I think every time There's you so hit a mile, you have a you have a new a new challenge to face. Um, I mean, capital is one of my biggest challenges because you always need more money. Um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, I think when they first dropped in my lap was probably my biggest challenge, and probably my, my wife's biggest challenge and my kids' biggest concern. Okay, Dad, you have five thousand of these things. You have a full time job. How are you going to move these things? And I knew it took a lot of education. I knew it took a lot of social media posts. I knew it took a lot of demos. And all I could do is get out there. You know, I did any show and every show I could possibly do. I, I started connecting with fashion shows in the area. I started um, picking up the phone and just calling stores in the area, walking in and being ready for rejection. The owner's not here. Or, no, thank you. Or, that's dumb. Or, that's stupid. You know, just get ready for all kinds of different things you're going to hear. And then every once in a while, you have a store that says, oh, that's really cool. We'll give it a shot. And like, yes, you know, and that energy, that excitement, that positivity is what gave you the energy to go to the next 10 stores and get turned down nine out of 10 times. Uh, but that's really probably the biggest challenge is uh, not even developing the product. I think the biggest challenge is once you have the product, now you got to educate everyone what mm. it is and how it works. And the only way you get any validation that you have a good product is when they pay. So if you go a long stretch with nobody paying and no one buying and no one wanting, it takes its toll on your mental space. I mean, obviously, mental health is a big part of America now, and we're more aware of the mental health of people. But being an inventor is not an easy mental health game to play. Uh, you, you're the most excited person of anybody. Uh, and then you obviously want to hire salespeople, and they're going to be easier to uh, to disappoint, easier to uh, to give up because it wasn't their baby. You know, if it's your baby, it, you're going to fight to the very end, just like when someone calls your kids ugly, which hope they never do. But you're going to offend those kids because you gave birth to them. You've raised them. They're your, your blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, and your invention becomes very much the same way. That's your baby. And you're going to go and you're going to keep presenting. If someone doesn't get it, you're going to try and be patient. You're going to take a breath. And you're going to keep hanging in there and explaining to people. Like, I have people walk by me at the mall now. And I'll say, I have a great tool for your collar. So I'll do this little motion right here. And they're like, no, I'm good. I have collar stays. I'm like, you have a collar stays. Keep a collar straight. It doesn't lift the collar. No, I'm good. Like, it's just that kind of type of ignorance that I just can't help everybody. And if they would take two right. seconds and open their mind and let me explain to them the difference between what the perky collar does and lifting, what a collar say does, what the magnet does when it brings it in, and what the million dollar placket does and keeping the placket straight. They're all different products. They all solve different problems. But if you think you know it all, you're going to continue to be ignorant. My job is to stop you. Those that I can. Not everybody wants to be stopped. Nobody's willing to listen. But those who are willing to listen, help them, educate them. And that's not easy. And that's probably my biggest challenge is once you have something that's brand new that no one's ever seen before, educate people with enough passion and conviction to get them on your, on your side, get them to be a believer, get them to be an advocate, get them to go on a rooftop and scream at the top of lungs how much they love the product. And then give them a platform, videotape them, uh, get you know quotes off of you know reviews on Google and Amazon and so on and so forth and share those with people. Because there's a lot of people that aren't even willing to try yet. Like, oh, I'll wait till... He sells 5,000. Oh, I'll wait till he sells 10,000. Oh, I'll wait till he sells 100,000. 
Same with the licensing. I want to license this product to shirt manufacturers. They're right now, they're just waiting for proof of concept. They're waiting for enough people to say, this device needs to be in the collar, just like they did in the 1950s when they added the collar stay. Enough people said there needs to be some kind of support on the tip of the collar for them to add the collar stay and to add the sleeve to put the collar stay in. But it takes numbers. So right now I'm in a battle of numbers and that's a big challenge. And my challenge is to get the shirt manufacturers to say, this device needs to be in every dress shirt we make from now on because it makes the collar look so much better. The bottom line is, is that the shirt manufacturers want to sell more shirts. So they believe the quicker the collar lays flat, the quicker the collar looks old, the quicker they buy more shirts. And they're afraid to enhance the collar to the point where the shirt lasts longer and looks newer longer than it may affect their sales. And that, in my opinion, is a whole shirt manufacturers back from making a very important innovation and improvement to dress shirts globally. Well, and, I, and I've got to admit that your your perseverance is, is amazing because I mean because what, what you're talking about uh, as far as uh, perseverance is concerned is you know um, is not not stopping because people say no or people people are not uh, uh, influenced and they may be a lot of naysayers but this is going to be true with anybody I mean if you're an author of a book or if you've got a, a talk that you give or you know whatever it is that you want to do that that could be revolutionary uh, you, you definitely learn from David here about you know just having that perseverance to get past all those naysayers and so and to keep following your dreams and over time as David has over the last say 10 or so years he's now went from a a concept that he was building in his uh, in his house to now being a national as well as an international brand okay so congratulations on that David thank you there's still a lot more to go we're working on franchising the the perky kiosk we've created here in the Charlotte market uh, we've just finished with all the franchise disclosure documents, getting all the sales manuals and training manuals, operation manuals all done. So we're ready to bring this to more cities across the country. Atlanta, D.C., Miami are our target cities right now. We'd love to be in Nashville and Detroit and up in the New York, New Jersey area. Uh, so we're really excited about that next chapter. So I think chapter one was developing a product that was unique and different that solved a problem. Step two is to develop a clothing innovation brand that solves problems uh, related to clothing. Uh, and I think stage three was to say, okay, now that we have all these cool innovations that solve problems, now how can we take it to other cities, other markets, and let other people solve problems as well? Uh, and we're excited about that next step. It's it's another big journey. It's another big challenge. You talked about earlier. What's your biggest challenge? Well, developing this franchise and selling my first franchise, I think, is one of the toughest parts. But a lot of it has to do with you know who already is a customer, who's already a fan of the business, who's already a store that buys from me that could be my first five franchise owners, and then from there. The numbers will take care of itself. Uh, I just need it to run without me. Uh, and that's the hardest challenge right now is how do I show great numbers when I'm not involved with the day-to-day -day business? But if you're going to scale, that's the that's the secret sauce. It has to do well without you. And obviously, as it does well without me, it also gives me my quality of life back as well and gives you some time away from work, which that life balance is also very important to me. And uh, I, I'm really hoping this franchise thing takes off and uh, we, we get more markets and I can get into away from the kiosk and do more training and do more seminars and do more um, hands on training with other managers across the country and let them help people in their city. And then I become duplicatable, which is really exciting. Now, what would you tell somebody else that has an idea? Uh, obviously, not a perky color idea, but it has an idea, it has an invention. What, what, what would you tell that person? You know, I would say find out if there's a demand for what you're solving and how big is that demand? Is it local? Is it statewide? Is it just the county? Is it regional? Is it national? Is it international? I think that's step one. How big is a problem you're going to solve? Uh, I think once you determine how big the problem is going to solve, I think next you got to figure out, is it already out there? You know, do your, go to your Google uh, patents, go to the, uh, the patent office in D.C., uh, and just do your research and hire a patent attorney to do the research if you're not able to do it fully yourself, uh, because you don't want to spend much time and money developing a product that's already out there. Uh, if you do mm -hmm. find that the product already out there, then maybe there's a way for you to modify the product that's already out there to make it better. Uh, so that's a possibility, but you don't want to develop, be developing the same product that's already out there. So the research before you do it is important. I think once you do that, uh, then it's a matter of, do I want this to be my full-time job? Because I think a lot of people are engineers, they like to tinker, they like to solve problems, uh, but they don't have the sales and marketing background. So you have one or two options. You're going to have to become that sales or marketing guy or a girl, or you're going to have to hire a team to sell it. 
and understand when you hire someone to sell it for you, they're not going to be as passionate or excited about the product as you are because you create the product. So you already have a, a tougher road to, to hoe because they're not going to have the same enthusiasm that you have. Uh, but I, I think the best way to do it, honestly, is to develop it yourself, make sure it's not out there, make sure it's a huge demand, make sure it's a huge problem, and then get out there and sell it yourself. Even if it's outside your comfort zone, it's okay. You're going to grow as a person. If every day is comfortable, you're not really pushing yourself anyway. So try a new skill. Try to develop your communication skills. Get out there at trade shows. Get out there on social media. Videotape yourself, even if you don't like it. Uh, get out there because you're going to hear the feedback from the customers directly. And that feedback is so crucial in your product development, in the tweaks you need to make in that product, in that first 10 stores, those first 50 stores, those first 100 stores. And then once it gets going, then you can start delegating. But I think it's important, even if you're an engineer and you don't like sales, you don't like marketing, you don't like being told no, I think it's still important. I think the most successful inventors get out there and sell it for a good period of time before they turn it over so they get the feedback directly from the customers uh, and not be afraid to fail. It's okay. Failure is not going to, it'll hurt for a second. It's like a shot. It hurts for a second. It's like a pinch. It hurts for a second. You'll get over it. You know, but it's that fear of failure. I think that holds most people back. And just don't be afraid. Mm. Life's too short to be afraid to fail. And fail, learn, and and, mo and make modifications as a result of that failure. And don't look at the failure as an end-all, be-all. Failure is a learning process. So once you learn from those mistakes, then the next rendition will be better. And once you learn from the way you, you presented it, you'll learn differently. Uh, there's just a lot to learn. And you just have to be open-minded to the learning process and not be afraid to fail. Well, thank you for saying that because I mean I've been saying that as well for uh, quite a few years. Because um, uh, back in two thousand nine, I started shooting video of the real estate houses that, that I was marketing at that time, and I would you know I I was afraid of the camera. I was afraid of you know recording video. What you know what's somebody going to say? Am I going to do this right? But the thing is, like you just said yourself, as an inventor yourself, is that it's okay to fail because all a failure is is another way of uh, of not succeeding. So as long as you learn from that, then you can, you can grow. Like what does it say? What, what does it say in that? Uh, I, not Einstein. Uh, uh, Edison failed like ten thousand times before he invented the light bulb. So he just right. said, "Well, this is. I know this is going to work. I just found a way that doesn't work. It's keep and just keep going. Just just persevere." Right. Look at Colonel Sanders. He came up with the, the original KFC recipe when he was seventy two, I believe. And we miss him. We're ready to retire and be done. He's just getting started. No, so we're getting want... started, but uh, almost every single restaurant said no. <laughs> we don't need right. that <laughs> recipe. And the point is, you're never too old. You know, to, to, to don't use age as an excuse as to why you can't bring a product to market, why you can't start a business. Yeah, age, gender, race, and none, and, uh, none of that actually matters. So, uh, so David, as we're about to wrap up, uh, if somebody wanted to learn more uh, about you, about your, uh, about the perky collar, about that, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, so the company website is the company name, which is Perky, P-E-R-K-Y-L-L-C.com. I'm on all the social media handles from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to X to TikTok, uh, Snapchat, all under Perky LLC, even Pinterest and Tumblr. Uh, I'm very active on all those, uh, posting pictures of myself uh, just for fashion tips for people. I also started my own Facebook group called That's My Vibe, V-I-B-E, because I wanted there to be a platform for people that could share their outfit for the day that they're excited about or proud about or an outfit they put together for a wedding or an outfit they put together for a gala. And it's a place to share, showcase it and get ideas from other people. I found a lot of other Facebook groups were very negative and um, you know, they, they weren't necessarily positive and when, when it comes to compliments of, of a look or an idea. Uh, there's nothing wrong with feedback, but it's, it's nothing for people just to go on there because it's social media and they can just be nasty. So I wanted to have a safe place where you can just comment and not worry about someone just ripping a new one or making you feel bad for what, you know, the color combination or what you decide to do. We're all trying new things. We're all trying to figure things out. I never wore a fedora my entire life until two years ago. Now I wore one almost every single day. Uh, and it, it took some time. I had to figure out the, the short brim, the long brim, what looks good on me. Uh, so it, you have to kind of go through that process of living and learn. I also have my own podcast called the Perky Collar Radio Show. Uh, we had over a million listens, which is exciting. That just happened November of last year. Where I interview business owners and entrepreneurs and give them a chance to share their story. Uh, I also have the Charlotte Entrepreneur Think Tank here in Charlotte, where if you're a business owner in the area or you're in town, uh, the first Thursday of each month, you're welcome to come join our uh, in-person entrepreneur group just to live, learn, support, uh, help uh, each of our local entrepreneurs. Um, 
and I think that's about it. So the Entrepreneur Think Tank, the podcast, uh, Perky LLC. We now have Perky Franchising LLC. Uh, that keeps me busy. I do want to get the box real quick so I can show you the audience what it looks like. So for those of you that are out in the audio world, uh, go and check uh, ch check us out on YouTube so you can see what this box looks like. So here's the, the Perky Collar box. Has a little purple okay. tab and just it up. And the perky collars inside there. And it's nice because it's got a magnetic lid too. So it keeps it all nice and organized. The back of the box basically gives you a very clean, simple explanation of how to use the product, which I showed you earlier. Basically lift the collar, add the perky collar, put the collar down on top of it. And that's it. And that's the perky collar. And again, everything else has happened from there. And that's a cool thing about my story is that it all started with one invention of one product. And then it turned into a business full of other innovative products. Then it turned into a retail space and now it turned into a franchise. So you just never know what single step can lead to. So get started today. Take that first step today and don't look back. You can't change the past. So I look at it. The, the, as they say, the windshield is much bigger than the rear view mirror. That's for a reason. So keep plugging away. Keep pushing forward. And when you run into challenges, keep pushing forward. Even if it's a small step each day, it makes a big difference. Not only that, uh, David did mention uh, about uh, what sounded like he has a, a mastermind group uh, in the Charlotte area, which is his kind of, in a way, his give back as well. So not only is he is he building a business, but also he get, he's got to the point where hey, now how can I help inspire other people or help other people as well? So there's there's also that whole aspect of giving back to uh, to other uh, uh, business owners and uh, in his case, other inventors. So congrats, exactly. congratulations on that. And I don't know if you can still, if I'm too shadow with this, but this is this is my black fedora with a white bottom. And it really comes down to, and you look good, you feel good. And it's so great when people come to me and say, I don't wear hats, hats don't look good on me. And it, it, you find a hat that looks good on them, and they walk away, their wife says, I like how you look in that hat. Or even women walk by when you're trying the hat on and go, who are you wearing that brim now? It's just, it does such a great thing to men's confidence. It makes us feel good. So why not? Why not try a hat? And why not just take your fashion level to the next level? And if you've never done it before, like I said, I've never wore a fedora like this in my entire life until April of 2022. And uh, now I wear one every day. And it's a great look. And uh, I get a lot of compliments when I go into places. So no matter where you're watching or listening to this podcast or this interview, you know, think about adding a, a hat to your wardrobe. You know, the next event you go to, add a hat, add a bow tie, uh, add a lapel, you know, add a pocket square, you know, go open collar. Uh, if you're going to a black tie, doesn't mean you have to wear a black tie. doesn't mean you have to wear a black bow tie. You can wear, they just don't want you wearing jeans and tennis shoes. Ever since COVID, everyone went super casual. So you can still look professional uh, by wearing an open collar, by throwing a lapel, by throwing a pocket square, get all the colors to coordinate, uh, and, and just have fun with fashion. And people will notice. And it'll be a lot of fun when you walk out of the house and your wife's like, wow, you're, where are you going all dressed up? Because she's surprised as well. Or you walk in the office a little more dressed up than normal. Or you walk into court a little more dressed up than normal. Or you walk into a gala or a sneaker ball or a wedding. People are going to notice the transformation. And we only live once. So have fun with your fashion and enjoy it. And also, this is also a great way to uh, to build your brand. Uh, so uh, like with uh, with David here, when you're wearing the hat, um, that's not part of his brand. So I mean, that's just, so he so he stands out as being different. So it doesn't matter what you do, but you know, go ahead and, and change some of those accessories just so that you stand out as you building your brand. Now, uh, David, are, is there, are there any last words that you'd like to uh, give to anybody before we go? I know you gave us a lot, but is there any last things you, that you would like to say before we leave? Yeah, I, I think if, if you're looking to be an entrepreneur, um, it's it's a tough road. I mean, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, even to this day, there's days, weeks, months um, that are, are very challenging. And obviously in the retail space, you're going to have uh, some tough times, like January, February are tougher months. So you try and plan for it the best you can. Um, understand that budgeting is not always the easiest thing to do during the lower times of your revenue. And those are things you try not to plan for. Uh, hopefully you have a partner that understands the the rocky road of entrepreneurship. And they're a good support system. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of highs, but there's also lows. And it's just to be able to pre be, prepared, be prepared for those lows and have people around you that can support you in those lows. Like, hey, if you're looking to split bills, hey, honey, I need you to pick up a little bit of slack for me in January or February. Or maybe July is a slow month for you because you know ahead of time based on numbers, those are tough months. So the key is to surround yourself with people that love you and care about you and want to see the best for you. 
and that can help you during tough times. And I would say also keep your full-time job until the invention can can pay for itself. You know, I think I left a little early, but I was excited. But I think having that money coming in, that flow of cash is crucial. You're always gonna need more money. I can tell you right now, if you think you have enough money to bring a product to market, I don't care how much money you have, you need more. Because there's always a, a, another trade show to go to. There's always another batch of inventory you need to buy. There's always uh, something you need to buy. Inventory uh, takes a drop or you need to go out and you know travel and, and go to a, a big convention that costs more money and hotel and airfare and all these other things add up. So just make sure you're always saving along the way the best to your ability. Uh, always watch your profit, your profit margins, make sure the items you're selling is profitable uh, and make sure you have the things people want. Uh, I try them all. I try and make sure I have things that nobody else has. Uh, I also make sure I say hello to everyone. So now I have people at Macy's and Belk and Dillard's and Nordstrom's and me and Marcus all sending customers to me because there's things I have that they don't have. And that referral base is a huge part of my business. Uh, and making sure if you do pick them all, make sure the mall has high traffic. Uh, make sure the mall has high traffic uh, and keep you uh, keep you busy as much as you possibly can. Uh, and make sure that you know, there's a, a constant flow of new people coming in. It's a tourist mall helps. Uh, local people will support you to some degree, but it's going to be hard to get uh, the, the full-time support you need 12 months out of the year from just locals. So make sure you pick the right mall and do your research. Uh, that's really the last thing I want to add is just, you know, the, how hard the battle is. But if you do it, do it and do it to the best of your ability and give it all you got. And one of the biggest things that David mentioned there is that being an entrepreneur can be a roller coaster ride because you will have highs, you will have lows, making sure that you have that support system uh, in in either regards. On your highs to share your wins and your lows to say, hey, hey, David, you can do this. You, you, you can get past this, uh, this issue. So, uh, David, again, I want to say thank you for being on the show today. Uh, and I want to say uh, thank you for everybody that, that, that's listening here. Now, if you're a listener on the show and you feel like you know somebody that could be a, a great guest for our show as well, go ahead and just go to businessamplify.net forward slash pre-interview without the dash. So just uh, businessamplify.net forward slash pre-interview. That will do a 15-minute call. So we're going to see if you're going to be all right for the show. David, again, I want to say thank you for being in the show. All of your information is going to be down in, below in, in the show notes. And, uh, and if they reach out to you, take, take great care of them. And thank you for being uh, on the show today. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for listening. Well, and, and until next time, guys, be amazing. Thanks for tuning in to another empowering episode of Business Amplified with Kevin A. Dunlap. If you found value in today's insights, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the podcast. Keep amplifying your business. And remember, your success journey is our inspiration. Until next time on Business Amplified, go out there and make your business thrive.